ओम ज्ञान तिरंधस्य ज्ञानाजनशलाकाय चक्षुरोता तस्म श्रीगुर नम हरे कृष्णा सो थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर गिविंग दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू स्पीक टुडे ऑन द ओकेजन ऑफ इन माष्टमिंग कमिंग अप सून सो आई एल टॉक द अपियरेंस ऑफ कृष्णा एंड आई एल स्पीक बेस्ट फॉर पॉइंट to show how the, to discuss how the appearance of krishna illustrates the beauty of the krishna conception of the divine so that's the beauty of the krishna conception there are many there are various traditions in the world and they all have the concept of god almost every tradition throughout history has been theistic uh, there have been very few uh, if any sustainable traditions which have actually functioned based on atheism but even when there have been theistic traditions to work throughout the world they have had their own particular conceptions of god so there's a difference between the concept of god and the conception of god the concept of god refers to the idea that he, as we move forward over here the concept of god usually is associated with god's greatness oh god is present everywhere and watches everyone god is powerful and can can punish even the most powerful people and god is uh, omnipresent omniscient omnipotent this is the defining attributes of god and that comprises the concept of god so all traditions talk about god's greatness and in fact historically speaking the faith in a god who keeps account of our actions or a god to whom we are accountable is has been one of the greatest civilizing forces in human history civilizing forces means that that's what keeps people civilized that people see all of us have a lower side and a higher side and this lower side and the higher side if we consider we restrain our lower side not just because of the greatness of our character yes it should be like that because we are so noble that we don't give in to our sensual desires we don't give in to greed but it is not just because of that there is also the fear of punishment which is important now if say a country imagine if in a country the all the police go on strike now of course sometimes the police may do excesses and there are protests against that and that's understandable nobody no department should have inordinate power or abuse their power but imagine if all the police went on strike then all the criminals would strike and there would be chaos in society so so just as there is a system of deterrence within the normal within the normal um society so similarly there is a higher vision where there is an understanding that god uh, is the one whom we are accountable for just as we are accountable to the human law so similarly we are accountable to the cosmic law to the divine law and that acts as a civilizing force and for this civilizing force to be effective there has to be a portrayal of god's greatness just like if the criminals or, or even the potential wrong doers they have no fear of the police if they think we are much stronger than the police and the police won't be able to do anything to me then what we would have is like the mafia mafia rule in some part of the world or the underworld has its own dons so then that becomes problematic so the not so not only should the police be powerful but the police should be seen to be powerful for it to act as a for the police to act as deterrent for 
uh, criminal like criminals so similarly all theistic traditions stress god's greatness and when god's greatness is stressed quite often that is associated with fear of god so in the abrahamic religions especially in in the bible as well as in the quran there is the stressing of how god is so great and fear of god is said to be the beginning of wisdom and that's important yes there has to be fear of god now here fear is not in the sense of like terror or horror or paranoia it is not the kind of fear that say if we come to know that a path a violent sociopath is at loose in our community and we are constantly terrified will that person suddenly uh, break into my house <clears throat> or if we know that terrorists are there and that is a different kind of fear that 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 is horror terror but fear here refers refers to a healthy fear like the kind say a child would have if a child is about to do some serious mischief and knows my parents may catch me so it's it's the fear of god which comes from knowing his greatness is centered on two things reverence and deterrence it is a reverential fear it is a respectful fear it is not it's not like a scary or paralyzing kind of fear it's a reverence so reverence and deterrence the God, uh, the vision of god's greatness needs to be centered on these two things but either way that's it's important to have this vision uh, to ha- to serve the purpose of civilizing humanity however this vision can civilize humanity this vision of god but it won't spiritualize humanity what is the difference between civilizing and spiritualizing civilizing humanity means that you don't do wrong things act in a civil way act in a socially so, so not don't do anti social activities so civilizing is important but beyond civilizing is spiritualizing just like if a child has only a fear for his for their father then that's not a very holistic or fulfilling relationship even the father wouldn't want just a relationship based on fear uh, so that's more like the father is treated more like a cop rather than a parent now sometimes parents also have to play the role of a cop and discipline but that's not the if if we ask many of your parents now disciplining children is not the part of parenting that you look forward to and relish what you relish is seeing how your child grows and and how the child develops the potential and becomes the wonderful person that they can become so similarly the need from our perspective you the relationship with god is not very cherishable if it's focus only on his greatness which induces fear within us nor is that relationship relishable from god's perspective so the bhakti tradition reveals a sweet uh, a conception of god that is centered on his sweetness now sweetness means that here the focus is not so much on how great god is but on how personable how lovable how attractive he is and that is the vision of the krishna conception of god so the way i am differentiating but i said there's a difference between the concept and the conception so concept refers to the broad idea of god is yes, god is a powerful being god is omnipresent being like that that these are the basic cons- the attributes of god but conception means so when we talk about the concept of god it is associate more with the position of god but when you talk about the conception that's associate more with the depiction what kind of person so 
the prime minister or there is a, in india there is a prime minister in america there is a president so that is a president or prime minister is the position and the every person or any person who is in that position will have certain powers but in the history of any country no although every head of state will gain some power just by that position but that doesn't mean every head of state will be equally liked hmm? some people have a very charismatic personality some people may have charismatic person others may have charismatic personality but they might be very divisive so they might polarize they attract some people but they alienate some people so just said there is the position of the prime minister and there is a person who is occupying that position so in most religious traditions if we focus the spotlight the spotlight when re, when talking about god or discussing god is in the position of god it is not so much on the person who is occupying that position now in the case of a prime minister or a president i mean it's like the position is fixed and the person occupying it keeps changing it's not like that in the case of god the god is eternally supreme and the it's not that the person occupying the position changes the person is the same but what the bhakti tradition does is it shows who is the person occupying this position and sometimes the focus goes so much on the person that the position itself may be forgotten not forgotten in the sense that it is not known but that is not what is highlighted so sometimes nowadays this may be done even as a pr exercise where some head of state their human aspect is shown you know how they have a normal what what do they do in the normal life what kind of relationships they have with their family with their friends or how that person is separate from their post and if that person separate from their post is also kind gentle helpful court, uh, courteous and they have some virtues that makes them even more attractive so similarly the in the bhakti tradition the focus especially say for example the 10th canto of shrimad bhagavatam is not so much on the position of god as on the person occupying that position in fact in many ways the previous cantos they focus on the position of god so for example the virat roop this is described in second canto of shrimad bhagavatam then the how great god is that is conveyed through stressing that is depicted and thereby the position of god is stressed and it's important without stressing the position of god we cannot move forward in a constructive way in our lives so like that the bhagavatam does that repeatedly so beyond that there is the person occupying that position and that is depicted to be krishna so now here one problem that may often come up is that so the way we are discussing it over here is that how is so there is the there is the there is the vision of the person as the in the position then when we get that vision sometimes that can seem a little confusing so one question or one one thing that stump that cause that stumps uh people from other religions when they hear about the krishna conception of god is that he seems limited he seems limited just like a, especially krishna as a child seems inconceivable what's going on here so but the fact is that krishna he although he is unlimited he is not stuck with his unlimitedness it's not like so, suppose somebody is 7 foot person they look very impressive oh you are 7 feet tall but then if they have to go through a normal door and then they have to bend down otherwise their head will strike against the top of the door the top wall above the door so they are stuck with their unlimitedness but krishna is not stuck with his unlimitedness you know he is unlimited when he wants he can manifest in unlimited form and when he wants he can manifest a limited seeming form and the idea is both of these he does 
based on what serves his purpose so god's inconceivability is that how can a unlimited seeming person manifest in a limited seeming form how does that work at all that works because he is unlimited and he is not he is not stuck with his unlimitedness so sorry so we see the virata rupa over here that he is unlimited but still he can manifest in a limited seeming form and still stay unlimited so there are three things over here we say god by his defining attribute in the concept of god he is unlimited just like say sometimes there might be a a very say the a constable or the police commissioner or the head of police they might look very fierce and very grave and very strong when they are in office and that's for the purpose of deterrence they want to the the people who are under them to take them seriously but when that same person comes home they might just be an embodiment of sweetness and they have a big smile on their face and especially they're dealing with a child they might play and make weird faces and what happens by that it's appealing in a different way so god is similarly unlimited then he become he can manifest in a limited form but even while he's manifesting in a limited form at any moment he can manifest his unlimitedness also so krishna had become a charioteer for arjuna and as a charioteer he was in a very limited position in fact we could say that there are hundreds of warriors on both sides in terms of position were at a superior position to him there were hundreds of hundreds of warriors on chariots and in the natural hierarchy of things the chariot warrior is in a higher position than a charioteer so externally speaking krishna had taken a position that was subordinate not just to arjuna but to all the chariot warriors and yet although krishna was just on one place in the universe universe itself is such a big thing krishna was on one place on a chariot that was on one place on the earth which is just in one place within the universe so although krishna was within the universe the universe was within him and that's what he revealed to arjuna when he revealed the vishwarupa so although god krishna is inside the universe the universe is still inside krishna and that is krishna's unlimitedness so when we have to appreciate krishna or god holistically there are two distinct aspects to it no god's greatness brings up understanding god's greatness brings submission and understanding god's sweetness brings affection and when submission and affection both come together then there is a deep devotion the devotion that emerges thereby is profound it is sublime it is enriching when there is devotion that is based only on appreciation appreciating god's greatness then that is too much filled with fear and when there is a focus only on the affection then what happens then there is not a, again a holistic understanding because one may take god cheaply one may so if we consider from the perspectives of world religions if there is too much focus on god's greatness then we have quite often the uh, the abrahamic religions and their conception of god which focuses on fear uh, now of course in christianity what happened is that uh, jesus talked about a god of love and how god is loving and god is forgiving and that contrasted significantly with the vision of god as given in the old testament so the old testament is called the hebrew bible that is the sacred book of the jews and the new testament most of which is uh, is uh, the gospels the most important part of it is the gospels which is uh, about the life of jesus and then there are the epistles of paul 
which are one of the prominent prominent pro pro prophets of Jesus, gave instructions to his followers. He wrote letters, and they became the epistles. So that's there in the New Testament. So what happened was, because there was no Jesus talked about a God who was loving, but that did not gel very well with the conception of God, with the with the description of God that was given in the Old Testament. And that was one factor. And apart from that, these are the factors because of which effectively Christians made Jesus into God. And then talk about how Jesus was very loving and forgiving. And then there, uh, they had that idea that God is filled with love. But then what has happened? They made Jesus into God. Although it is very clear, Jesus says that I am not the father. I have been sent by the father. So, so there also, in order to develop affection, there had to be like a loving depiction. And that loving depiction, they made, they focused on Jesus because there was no loving depiction of God, Christ itself. But in the Bhakti tradition, there is a different description of God as a person who is very attractive. So if there is only excessive focus on the God's greatness, then that doesn't, that leads to a fear-based relationship. But if there is a preliminary focus on God's sweetness, without duly appreciating God's greatness, then we have the Sahajiyaik kind of uh, approach to God. Wherein people tend to approach God in a way that is, that is cheap. So let me explain this. So why do you mean by approaching God in a way that is cheap? See, basically, Within the, I earlier talked about how the, the, the idea of God who, to whom we are accountable is one of the greatest civilizing forces in human history. So people need to be civilized and they need to be spiritualized. So what happens is by understanding God's greatness or focus on God's greatness may civilize people, but there's not much inspiration to spiritualize them. However, if there is preliminary focus on God's sweetness, then people claim that they are spiritualizing themselves without actually civilizing themselves. What do you mean by civilizing themselves? That means they don't become basically cultured, moral, responsible. Uh, so the deterrence aspect is overshadowed. And this happened in a very unfortunate way within our tradition. What happened was that, see, the Vedic tradition is very big. And sometimes uh, we say that Prabhupada has given us the Vedic teachings. And actually, that's not the most accurate way of describing things. Srila Prabhupada, through his, through his books, has not exactly given us the Vedic teachings. He has given us the best of the Vedic teachings. The Vedic teachings... I incorporate people from those who are in the mode of goodness, the, who are very ready to be spiritual, down to the people who are in the mode of ignorance, who are quite materialistic. And that's why there are some forms of worship where even people, people drink like worshippers of some deities, they take bhang and then they think they're worshipping. Or sometimes some images, some animals are offered in sacrifice and meat is eaten but because the vedic form of vedic forms of worship include everyone and everybody from their level can move upward but the problem comes up when the sense of progression is lost and somebody who is at a lower level and they can follow some worship and move to a higher level but if they start thinking that they are already at a higher level then it becomes a big problem so what happened was that there is the Tantra tradition in India. Now, what is the Tantra tradition? Tantra tradition has the idea that we can approach spirit through matter. We can approach spirit through matter. That is called Tantra tradition. The Vedanta tradition is separate matter and spirit. And that's what the Bhagavad Gita, for example, the second chapter does. This is the body. This is the soul. Understand the contrast between the two. So now in deity worship, for example, in the Bhakti tradition, we are approaching the spirit through matter. 
we are approaching the divine through the manifestation of the divine in a material element so, so the dt is made of matter but dt is not matter because the divine is manifested through the dt so that is an example of tantra this is normally considered to be auspicious tantra but in auspicious tantra so why it's called auspicious tantra because generally whenever we worship the dt it's surrounded with very holistic clean uh, uplifting atmosphere and activities so most people even if they are criminals even if they are wrong doers if they go to a temple they will first uh, clean themselves they'll bathe themselves and they'll try to be pure at least in the vicinity of the temple mm, or in in the temple in the in the presence of the deity but in that there is inauspicious tantra where people do wrong activity people, people do activities that are not really spiritually uplifting and they claim that they are that is going to take them closer to god so so there is one deviant idea of tantra that is that so in modern times when there was this idea that when prabhupad came to america that people take drugs and they thought that by taking drugs we are going towards spirituality so what was happening over here we may say what is the strange idea how can drugs take you closer to spirituality but the idea the idea that they had is that okay we have some normal awareness and this normal awareness is limited and if we drink if we become intoxicated then we are no longer limited to the normal awareness and we can see something beyond the normal yes we can see something beyond the normal but that is not supra normal that is mostly del- delusional that is delusional delusional means just like if a person takes a lot of alcohol it's not that they start seeing god by that they start basically go maybe sometimes they go into a world where they imagine they themselves are god i can do anything that i want and that's why driving under influence is considered such a serious crime because again what happens alcohol is infamous for uh, removing the normal restraints that are there on our behavior the normal restraints we are say afraid of uh, afraid of the consequences of our actions the consequences could be that if i drive too fast i might run into some people i might kill someone i might kill myself but alcohol it removes those restraints it makes it makes people wild and reckless <clears throat> so you know in sometimes uh, in homes um, there are some devotees um, who work on right now i'm in govardhan eco village and here the devotees are doing social development also projects so they're talking about sometimes in families there are domestic violence so now there's it's a complex issue but what is found is most often domestic violence happens under the influence of intoxication sometimes some people are sadistic and they delight in violence but that's that's not so common so <clears throat> what happens is people drink and they lose their normal restraint so now in a perverse sense people think that some people used to think that uh when our normal restraints are removed then we will perceive something higher now they are perceiving something delusional not something spiritual unfortunately so similarly just as some people thought by drugs we will grow spiritually so some people imagined that through sensual indulgence we will go spiritually and in the shakta tradition they had the idea that now this is this is as i said this is a deviant idea this is not a scriptural idea but this is a deviant idea that say when uh, when a man and a woman unite then it is shiva and shakti who are uniting and they are enjoying through us so what happened you remember earlier i said that there is the civilizing aspect and the spiritualizing aspect but if the civilizing aspect is deterred then what happens is in the name of spiritualizing people start doing activities that are non civilized so indiscriminate kind of indulgence started happening and unfortunately this was adopted or you could say this was misappropriated misapplied in the bhakti tradition and then people some people who claim to be krishna devotees they started imitating krishna's raslila with the gopis 
and they started claiming that actually uh, when they would do that kind of imitation they said that actually krishna and radha are entering into us and they are enjoying through us so we are actually we are not being immoral it is we are becoming vehicles for krishna and radha to enjoy through us now the divine couple do not need our our decaying dying stinking bodies for for their sacred pastimes so this was a very distorted imagination and this have happened because there is not a clear understanding of god's greatness so therefore even when we are approaching krishna there has to be a balance in understanding krishna's greatness and krishna's sweetness both combined together so i'll uh, i'll conclude with one past time which depicts how krishna's greatness and sweetness are manifest in a very endearing way for those who have the eyes to see so this is the past time of krishna's appearance krishna's krishna's birth now normally we don't use the word birth because krishna is eternally existing he just manifests so if we look at the setting of krishna's past time what's happening it is quite dramatic and traumatic dramatic because so much has happened before that a prophecy has come that devaki's eighth son will be our eighth child ashtam garbha it's a, vishwanath chakrapur says and jeeva swami also emphasizes that that the word used there is gender neutral that it's just ashtam garbha the eighth eighth eight uh, child or eight pregnancy you could say so now it was presumed that yeah if somebody is going to somebody is going to kill a warrior as powerful as uh, karna uh, as kamsa sorry then that person would be a child so then kamsa out of brutality started killing or uh, killed the first six children of devaki and the seventh children child with through an apparent miscarriage and transference was taken to rohini's womb and he was born as balaram and so there was so krishna's parents were in a prison at that time now sometimes the question is raised that <clears throat> that if krishna if kamsa was so afraid why should uh, that that devaki's eight child <clears throat> would uh, kill him then why did he just not simply keep devaki and krishna separate devaki and vasudev separate then there there would be no child so the thing was that uh, kamsa didn't just want to want to protect his life kamsa wanted to protect his reputation and not just protect his reputation boost his reputation he was on a power trip the power trip means that some people just think that i am so great and in trying to prove their greatness they do all kind of crazy things so he he wanted to defy the gods now in in war he had already defeated all the gods and they would live in fear of him but he wanted to defy the gods by defying their prophecy so his idea was okay you said the eight eight child will kill me let the eight child be born and instead of he killing me i will kill him so it was out of his defiance his uh, he he wanted to some people gain their reputation by doing good things like say if there is a if there is a honorable law officer now in great danger they go and persecute they go and uh, arrest some criminals who's, who are very dead who are very te- terrorizing people and who are not so easy to apprehend then they are lauded as a great hero but somebody some person who is a criminal they might get their reputation by defying all odds so they sometimes may come into a police station and defy the police and and go away from there and the police can't catch them 
or if they go and destroy the police station itself then there will some clear some 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 criminals will stay away from the police but if the criminals are on a power trip they may say i'll go and burn the police station and then just see how powerful i am so they want to get a reputation that way so kamsa wanted to get a reputation like that and what did he do for that purpose he said let this child be born and i will kill him at that time so krishna he appeared in a situ- setting that was filled with drama and trauma normally if a child is born then there's so much care that is required to take uh, to ensure the child is born safely nowadays <clears throat> to prevent infant mortality which at least a few hundred years ago was very high especially during delivery now there are so many support systems available there are <clears throat> there are so many uh, there people are taken to the hospital and there are so much medical staff available even in traditional societies where say there is uh, no no hospitalization but at least there is a midwife available but in the case of krishna and uh, at that time you know it was all alone kamsa wanted to kamsa was quite brutal in that way and so devaki had to go through this repeatedly one after another after another and then finally when krishna appeared it was stunning that krishna he appeared in a fully he appeared not like any ordinary child and vasudev and devaki they were so stunned on seeing krishna because you know, krishna had hair and if you look at the prayers to krishna that were offered in the 10th canto so first the garbhastuti is the section of prayer third cha- third chapter which is describing the prayers offered by the devtas so first second third chapter describe the background of krishna's appearance and krishna's appearance so in the garbhastuti the devtas are offering prayers and there they are fully aware of krishna's position now when devaki sees krishna after krishna appears from her womb into the world at that time there is this remarkable uh, shifting between appreciating krishna's greatness and relishing his sweetness so krishna appears in a transcendental form he appears with fully growing hair and then he manifests a vishnu murti and there are four arms and at one level devki is thrilled oh this is the divine this is this is the supreme lord vishnu who has manifested here but she starts thinking how could he have manifested from my womb and is this really vishnu since it's, it's the human nature works in such a way that everything in nature is designed for a particular purpose so especially in human society the human babies we could say are the are the embodiment of helpless dependence all almost all living beings who give rise to their progeny there is a certain care amount of care that may be required but human progeny require the greatest care no sometimes in some species the eggs are just hatched and the birds grow on their own the fish it is said they just meditate on their offspring and the offspring just learn to grow on their own so then there is practically no care required but in terms of the long term how long care is required the human babies require the maximum care and the reason for that is that creates a sense of dependence and responsibility now when we see somebody so dependent in this this infant baby can't do anything without me then that creates dependence and in some ways the dependence actually strengthens the bond that creates a sense of responsibility so similarly <coughs> although krishna has manifested his forearm form but still devaki is thinking that krishna has manifested here in my home through my it's not her home but it's where she is staying currently 
and she's manifested through my womb. He is manifested through my womb. So I have a duty to protect. And she thinks, oh, Krishna, how can I protect you? you know, if you look like a four-armed child, then Kamsa will know that you are extraordinary. And somehow, because of her motherly affection, she doesn't think that if my child is looking extraordinary, maybe he is extraordinary. Maybe he will kill Kamsa. But she thinks, I am a mother. I have to somehow protect my child. And she prays to Krishna, 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 please, please, you know, uh, I manifest an ordinary form so that I'll be able to hide you. And Krishna very sweetly and cordially reciprocates. And then he unmanifests his uh, Vishnu form and becomes a small, helpless, but still eminently lovable baby. And then what happens thereafter? Krishna informs Vasudeva. So now my dad, you know, take me across the river to, across the Yamuna to Vrindavan. And here, normally, it is the parent that, that instructs the child. But here the child instructs the parent. It is normally the parent who empowers the child. That means if there is a bully who is threatening the child and the, the parent, the, the father comes and stands next to the child and the bully cools down. But in this case, it is Krishna who empowers Vasudev. Vasudev has been in that prison cell for such a long time. And Kamsa has kept, Kamsa knows it is his life that is at stake. Just like if there is a very important, uh, very dangerous criminal or uh, like that in a jail, then they have special security. So the guards which Kamsa has appointed over there, to guard Vasudev and Devaki, they are among the best guards of Kamsa. But while normally slipping away from those guards would have been impossible. What Krishna does is, Krishna by his mystical potency, he just puts all of them asleep. So they fall asleep and not only they fall asleep, somehow they, uh, the locks of the door open and Vasudev is able to slip away from there. So Krishna is in a tiny form. He is carrying, carried in a basket. Many of you may have seen that image of Vasudev carrying Krishna on his head. He is in a, is in a basket. But at the same time, he is, is so helpless, but he is arranging everything. And this Vasudev carrying Krishna on his head. This is a beautiful metaphor. You can, with this image, I will include in, in this class that for all of us, you know, we often have services. It could be our services we are doing to our temple, we are doing services for Krishna. We may also be serving our community, serving our family in a mood of, a mood of devotion. But whatever it is that we are doing, uh, Krishna sometimes gives us an opportunity to feel that you now that without us this service will not happen like vasudev is thinking if i don't get krishna across kamsa will kill him so vasudev is straining to his fullest capacity and he's, he's completely focused and actually concerned deeply concerned at the same time although vasudev is feeling that i have to do this at the same time, it is Krishna who is doing so much for him. It is Krishna who is facilitating his service. So similarly, for us, like I said earlier that a baby uh, often brings out a sense of responsibility in a parent because the, baby, the parent feels the baby is helpless without me, dependent on me. So sometimes, although we are all dependent on Krishna, Krishna creates a situation where it appears as if, you know, he is dependent on us, not he directly, but his services. So we may feel that oh, if I don't do this, then who's going to cook for the festival? Who's going to dress the deities? Who's going to make garlands for the deities? Who is going to arrange the festival? And so for all of us, when we have, we have some service and when we have faced difficulties in doing that service, then that is we are being given the privilege of being like Vasudev, carrying Krishna on our head. 
it is challenging but and we, we have to endeavor to meet those challenges but we need to know that whatever challenges we are facing it is krishna who is empowering us to face those challenges we do our best and krishna will do the rest and in that way we will be just as vasudev was successful in the mission to take krishna to safety so similarly whatever service we have to do by krishna's grace we will be in due course successful sometimes immediately sometimes in after some time sometimes we may go through despair and panic as happened to vasudev when when the baby slipped from a, the basket and fell into the ocean river and the river was filled with huge waves and vasudev was devastated you know i have lost everything that the same child for whom so many of we, we sacrificed for so long is he gone is he drowned is it my mistake and through all that all that churning of the heart his devotion was becoming greater and greater so similarly when we are trying to serve krishna say now especially with the pandemic coming up pandemic around us this janmashtami is going to be like no other janmashtami that we have experienced if at all there are we go to the temple it's going to be very limited sometimes we may not be able to go to a temple so it might seem so many things are so, so many things are unpredictable but everything that happens in our life is it brings challenges to us but if we face those challenges in a way that is devotional then we will all grow spiritual will all grow spiritually so for all of us we have janma every janmashtami provides us an opportunity whatever services we are doing if we can follow in the footsteps of vasudev and the service we are doing is as precious as vasudev carrying that basket on his head we for all of us we treasure our service like that it may not seem that important but for krishna every service is important and krishna can do extraordinary things even through ordinary instrument like us in the world when people often ask you know why is there is so much problem in the world why is god not answering my prayers why is not god manifesting a, a change the, the irony in the world is everyone wants a change but no one wants to change everyone wants a change but they want the change should happen automatically so this is a miraculous thing no but no one wants to change but just as vasudev take took responsibility on his own to make sure that the mission of krishna was done the instruction of krishna was fulfilled you know we all have the opportunity to take that responsibility rather than wanting the change we can pray to krishna that krishna manifest in our heart and he help us become the change and that way we all can be a play our part in civilizing and spiritualizing humanity that is the purpose for which krishna descends to this world and that is the purpose we all can cooperate in fulfilling by inviting krishna's presence in our heart on the occasion of janmashtami so i'll summarize i spoke today on the krishna conception of the divine i spoke about how the fear of a god to whom we are accountable has been one of the biggest civilizing forces in human history so understanding god's greatness what it does it it civilizes us just like fear of the police keeps people from doing crime however if the focus is too much on the fear of god this fear is meant to two purposes reverence and deterrence but that fear may not lead to a very a rich and intimate relationship so the bhakti tradition focuses on the sweetness of god so there is the concept of god which talks about the omnipotent omni omnipotence omniscience omni <clears throat> omnipresence that's like the position of god but who is the person occupying that position that is not revealed in most traditions of the world the bhakti tradition reveals that and that reveals him to be krishna a extremely loving and lovable person and it the bhakti tradition reveals krishna not just as omnipotent but often as a, like in this past time as a vulnerable child 
and then i talked about if there is too much focus on god's on fear of god then there is a very formal relationship with god not a very personal relationship but if there is premature focus on the sweetness of god then we have the tantra deviation wherein people start thinking that uh they when they imitate radha krishna's last leela they think that it is uh, radha krishna who is enjoying through them so that is so we need to avoid both so there a proper understanding of god's greatness and his sweetness so i we concluded by telling the pa- past time of krishna's appearance and how it was in a setting of great drama and trauma and krishna because babies invoke a sense of dependence so although devki saw krishna in a four handed form she thought that what if krishna will be killed by kamsa and so she saw his greatness but because of the maternal affection she focused on his sweetness she thought i have to protect and then i concluded by that vasudev carrying krishna on his head it's a sacra it's a sac service that requires great courage and sacrifice facing danger but at the same time it was krishna who was making all the arrangements although krishna seemed to be like a helpless baby in the womb baby in the basket it was he who put the guards to sleep it was he who opened the doors it was he who guided him through the stormy rains and the stormy ganga so jamuna so similarly when we have some difficult service to do krishna may create a sense that oh without me the service won't happen now that needs to create a stronger sense of responsibility within us and each one of us if we take up responsibility for krishna's service then whatever our service small or big it may be then krishna will manifest in our heart and in our life so everyone wants a change but no one wants to change and we can change that by inviting krishna into our hearts in the occasion of janmashtami and inviting him to civilize and spiritualize us so that we all can become his instruments of compassion in offering some relief to the people around us through sharing spirituality with them thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions or do we have time for questions yes ma'am we can take some questions no problem hare krishna madhubadi prabhu dandavat For any questions, the body stand on mute and ask questions. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Then Dr. Namal goes to Shilapa. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Then Dr. Namal. and dr prabhuji uh, thank you for the wonderful class um, in fact i was hearing radnath maharaj class uh, like the old class and he was also uh, talking about devaki's fear towards protecting krishna uh, but i my question is like you said that we should also have that mood of uh, um, i have to serve krishna i mean this is my service to krishna it is dependent on me we have to have that mood that vasudeva had but there is a difference between pure devotee such as vasudeva having that mood and uh, our uh, emotion right our emotion is always um, imbued with false ego right that without me this cannot happen like that thank you hari krishna okay so without me th- this cannot happen if we feel isn't that at our level wounded because of false ego see bhakti is so inclusive that you can even use our ego in uh, in the service of krishna this is bhakti can use the intelligence bhakti can use the mind bhakti can even use the ego in the service of krishna so that's that's the first point now having said that there are times when uh, in in the process of bhakti when we we feel that a uh, situation is created where we feel that we are indispensable i i need to do this without this this will it will not happen and when when i i'm not saying that we should feel like that but krishna sometimes creates situations like that and that may give when with that feeling comes up that sh- that should increase our commitment our responsibility a sense of commitment and responsibility but we all will quite of sooner or later face 
other situ other situations also when we realize that you know how how utterly we could say dispensable we are things go on without us things go on say whatever service it is there if we don't do it well in some cases it may happen that it doesn't happen but quite often if it's an important service it happens somebody else does it and maybe they may not do the exact same service in the exact same way they may do it in a different way so especially this is one advantage of going to big festival say if you go for a festival like jagannath rath yatra now of course because of social distancing the festival didn't happen the way it traditionally happens but there if you see millions of people are there now we might be in our own temple and we might be a senior devotee in that temple and as soon as we enter everybody offers us respect and you may think oh i'm so important but we go in a place where there are thousands there are millions of people and they're completely they're there because they they are there for jagannath so there we realize that we are in we are we are insignificant so in that sense in bhakti there is this there is both aspects just like with respect to god there is understanding god's greatness and understanding god's sweetness so similarly in bhakti there is on one side understanding our insignificance understanding that i am dis- dispensable that you know if i don't do it there's a beautiful letter of shila prabhupad where one of his uh, one leading disciples who was leading at that time he somehow left the krishna consciousness movement and prabhupad writes in that letter he said that i got i heard this distressing news about you he had apparently broken a regulatory principle and then he had just left so prabhupad did not say that how could you have done such a horrible activity prabhupad writes in a very personal way he says i heard this distressing news about you and see generally if something something bad has been done by someone there are different ways in which it can be spoken and that often requires expertise see in the uh, nowadays say for example suicide has become uh, it's not seen as a sign of weakness as it is seen as seen as a sign of uh, you know how unbearable situations that become in a person's life that they had to do take the step now what is the reality we don't know but the point is that sometimes nowadays he says he it didn't commit suicide he died by suicide that's the mainstream usage now okay, so x y z died by suicide that means that oh the the attempt is made to shift the culpability away from that person so similarly prabhupad in this letter is not blaming this devotee saying i heard this distressing news about you and i am feeling so forlorn the forlorn is actually a very poetic kind of english word the prabhupad studied english in a scottish church college he studied many of the british poets also and they use forlorn especially when somebody who is very dear is taken away and i am feeling so forlorn and prabhupad said that the chaitanya mahaprabhu wants this mission to spread all over the world and i felt that you were one of the assistants the chaitanya mahaprabhu had sent to me and then prabhupad continues and toward the end he says but i am confident that lord chaitanya will send me the right people to us to carry his mission all over the world if not you then someone else so if not you then someone else so in this letter itself at one level prabhupad is creating that sense of intimacy and almost you know i thought you were the assistant and i'm feeling so distressed so forlorn i'm feeling alone i'm feeling abandoned so prabhupad is almost acting as if you know that i need you yeah. but at the same time he concludes by saying i don't need you not that i'm rejecting you but my mission is not going to stop because you are not there so mm-hmm. in bhakti there are times when we need to feel insignificant that that cultivates humility for us but at the same time in bhakti we need energy we need enthusiasm and enthusiasm one way it comes is when we feel that we can do something of significance in fact the greater the significance of what we are doing uh, the greater is our energy suppose there is a janmashtami festival and somebody invites us please come to this temple okay i may or may not come but suppose if you are inviting some vip to come 
and we tell them that you know we want you to do the first abhishek oh i'll come because what happens they feel i'm doing something of significance now again you could say it's out of ego but in devotion in bhakti krishna wants us to for from krishna's perspective every service is significant for him as we know in the past time of building the bridge uh, ram considered the squirrels attempt to carry some small dust particles uh, to help in building the bridge also see as significant as, as the vanaras carrying big boulders so why is that stressed there's that aspect also that don't devalue any service so now we may say yes my service is significant but i am not significant okay you can put it that way but if somebody krishna is choosing somebody to do a significant service doesn't that mean that that person also has some significance so we need to definitely be afraid of uh, of arrogance and and becoming egoistic but there has to be a balance where the the sense of if so the sense of insignificance starts deenergizing us and preventing us from doing our service properly then we need to we need to minimize that we can't uh, nothing should be allowed to interfere with our service so sometimes the sense of how great i am can interfere with our service but sometimes the sense of how small i am can interfere with our service say if suppose we are asked to give a class and then if we think i am a great speaker and everybody should be there to attend the class and then we see very few people are there we may feel i am not going to give this class so then the my sense of how great i am is coming in the way of my service but sometimes in you know, if i start think i am told to give a class but then you know i am so fallen i can't speak this philosophy is so great i can't but you are told to do the service so don't let your sense of insignificance come in the way of the service so our primary connection with krishna is through service and sometimes krishna may ask us to do a service of great significance and from krishna's perspective so every service is significant in the world's eyes some services may be more significant than others but the important thing is that we shouldn't let either a sense of i am great i am so great or i am so small either come in the way of our service to krishna so if krishna creates situations where we feel needed for for a service we should understand that this is just krishna giving me a uh, impetus to do this service seriously does it answer your question yes prabhu ji thank you very much uh, there a lot of uh, inspiring and touching points thank you prabhu ji i'll hear again hari krishna so shall we stop here <clears throat> yeah i had a quick point uh, chetan yes. chandra bhu please please let me ask um i know you mentioned about krishna vasudev carrying krishna on his head there's another reference where it says he carried krishna at his chest and i don't know how uh <clears throat> where the uh, where we can find the exact reference of where he carried it okay yeah that's a good point did krishna carry vasudev or vasudev carry krishna on his around his chest near at his chest level or the head level well vishwanath chakravarty describes this that what happened was just like a normal child normal parent mm-hmm. and how do you carry a child you know, sometimes you put the child on our a uh, child put we put the child on our arms and carry him that is one way of carrying the child sometimes we put the child on the head so when vasudev was carrying the basket uh, basket containing krishna yes it was initially around his chest however as they entered into the yamuna and the yamuna's water started rising so then he became alarmed and then he put the basket on his head and that's why you know if if the basket had been on his around near his chest he would immediately have noticed that krishna has fallen but because the basket was on his head so he didn't immediately realize it it was that you know a small baby is also very light 
the basket is not very heavy but the baby was really light and that's why with, with all the water with all the rain and the thunder and the waves around he didn't realize that, oh this basket is suddenly seeming empty but by the time he realized he didn't know when had krishna fallen was it just a few moments ago or was it some more time ago and that's why he became panicky so mm-hmm. yes he was on the chest initially but especially when krishna fell okay that that at that time he was on his head oh okay from there he fell so both parts are true okay thank you thank you that reconcerts so, okay thank you very much shri krishna bhagwan ki ji jai thank jai. you जन्माष्टमी महामहोत्सव की रघुपाद की थैंक यू प्रभु हरे कृष्णा हैप्पी जन्माष्टमी टू यू जन्माष्टमी टू ऑल ऑफ यू आल्सो हरे कृष्णा थैंक यू प्रभु हरि बोल वेरी गुड अतन्यचरण प्रभु थैंक यू वेरी वेरी मच फॉर कमिंग आउट थैंक यू देवकीनंद प्रभु फॉर द अपॉर्चुनिटी सर थैंक यू वदपति प्रभु हम लोग वेसेंसेस